Thank you for joining us today in episode 76 of the Pool Chasers podcast. As always, our mission is to help educate and inspire in the form of a podcast. Real quick, with 2019 winding down, if you enjoy the podcast, we would really appreciate it if you could rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Please let us know how the podcast has helped you out this year and even tell us your favorite episode. This really helps us in so many ways. We're very grateful to be a part of this amazing community and we want to thank you all for the support. We provided a link below in the write-up, so if you take the time to do so, we really appreciate it. Today's guest has been on the podcast before. If you haven't listened to Katie's first episode, please check it out as she shared her story with us on episode 59. If you follow us on Instagram, which you should, (laughs) wink, wink, you know that we asked Katie to come down to the studio back in August. While she was here, we had the opportunity to take the CPO class with her, and it was a great experience. We learned so many things by taking the class, and a few that we didn't even know before. So we wanted to record an episode about the benefits of being CPO certified and how you can use that certification for more than just a paper it's printed on. Having the certification opens up many opportunities to you, some of which you may not even know existed. Katie does a wonderful job explaining all the options. We also discussed the certification importance and how you can use it for your business, website, social media, and to increase your sales and credibility. We really wish we had taken the time to take this class sooner and used it to its full potential back when we were running Brothers, which is why we wanted to share it with you. So please enjoy Katie Crisdale of Lakeview Aquatic Consultants. Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Viafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. Well, thank you so much for joining us again, Katie. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a great week. Yeah. So for all the people that are listening that don't know who you are or what you do, can you share that with everyone? Yes. So my name is Katie Crisdale. I'm the principal, which is a fancy word for the owner operator of Lakeview Aquatic Consultants Limited. We're located near Calgary, Alberta, Canada. So Great White North. Uh, We're about four hours south of Jobber in Edmonton. And the primary focus of the business is teaching classes. So I'm a certified pool operator instructor with the Pool and Hot Tub Alliance, formerly known as the National Swimming Pool Foundation, which is merging with the Association of Pool and Spa Professionals. I'm also a trainer for the Canadian Red Cross and the Life Saving Society. And so I also train lifeguard instructors, swimming instructors, first aid instructors, in addition to mentoring new pool operators, facility managers. It's a big jump to go from being a pool operator or a lifeguard into a management function at a large facility. And so I do a lot of one-on-one mentoring and coaching as those operators or those staff build the skills that they need to run all sides of their business. Oh, that's really good. Did you have to take a class on just how to say that? <laughs> yeah, no. you explained that very well. Wow. <laughs> you know I've what? talked to a lot of people and uh, they can stumble that one pretty good. <laughs> so you, everybody has to have their elevator pitch, right? You need to be able to get out what you do in a minute or less. And I will tell you that when I go through immigration, for example, to come to the United States, the first question is, what do you do? I work in pools. And then they look at you and then they go, what? And so you better have a good explanation. And then their next question, obviously, in immigration is, well, how do you make money doing that? Right. So it's really explaining that there's a huge market. Right. In the United States, there is over 10,000 commercial aquatic facilities. And that doesn't account for the residential sector. And there's a lot of support services that perhaps the residential pool service technician doesn't understand that build on the aquatics industry. So when I say the aquatic industry, I don't just mean the builders, the designers the pool operators, the service guys, there's all of the support services that also generate revenue from servicing pools, whether you sell software to program swimming lessons, whether you print flyers and brochures for commercial facilities, whether you provide training and support for managers. And so there's a lot to that industry and it's a robust industry. It's a growing industry. Health and leisure is a huge growing industry. And so we really do ourselves a disservice when we just say, I work in the pool industry. Right. 
I was going to say, when they ask you what you do, I'm sure you give it to them good. Like, oh, okay, okay, lady, uh, you got a card or something? I'll, I'll look into it. You can, you're, you're good. Get, you're get good. through the line. No. Get through. You don't yeah, need no they, passport. It's... You don't need nothing else. Just uh, <laughs> oh, you ask. So I'm going to tell you right now. Yeah, no. Don't but... be certified after uh, stopping you. I was going to say, you know what? Every interaction is a sales opportunity. I was at a resort yesterday and the guy opened up that can of worms and he left with a lot of good nuggets to think about right? Because you never know when your next client is going to be a referral from whomever, right? It's getting that brand awareness out there and you're always on in the, as a business owner, right? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't hear about this. What, what happened? Share, share the story. So uh, I'm in Arizona. It's beautiful. Loving all the pools in Scottsdale, visiting all the different resorts. And so I go and I photograph the pools and I put them on Instagram because I love pools. And so I go to different resorts. And yesterday I was talking to a uh, a customer, as in a hotel customer at the resort. And he, he he said the typical, so what do you do? Why are you photographing the pool? And I said, I, I'm a pool consultant. And he said, oh, what does that mean? And that precipitated a five or 10 minute conversation about the liability of swimming pools and what to look for when you go to a new facility as a, as a customer, right? I'm looking for scum lines. I'm looking for sanitation. I'm looking for cleanliness. I'm opening the skimmer lid. And he just said, oh, I, I had no idea there was that much to it. We have probably a pool. rocked his world. <laughs> every, time, every time he goes so to a So <laughs> the gorgeous uh, pool picture is not going to be what everyone's going to see on Instagram. That's going to be a bunch of arrows pointing at everything. Wrong, wrong, wrong. So it's, not, it's funny you mentioned that, Greg, but I reserve those for the stories. So you need to follow my Instagram stories to get the 411 on, oh, yeah. on the violations. And I don't tag the locations when there's a violation, but I do think it's an educational opportunity um, for people who have the time or the interest in following my stories and my travels to to really get some information about, you know, maybe they hadn't considered why something is not suitable in a commercial application or why they should look for these things. So how did he receive that information? Well, his wife was ready to go, so <laughs> oh. <laughs> they, they had to go. <laughs> or she was doing the hand pull, right? Husband, we're, we're going now, right? Why are you talking to this woman at a pool? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a show, and we'll wrap this up, this, this little section. But there's a show called Hotel Impossible. I don't know if you've seen it, but he goes in, and these hotels are a wreck. And when they get to the pool, um, the hotel owners are always in denial about you know what's going on. And they're like, dude, is there always like the guy sat on a chair, it broke. He went to the bench, the concrete slab cracked. Um, the pool is definitely crazy, crazy green. I mean, tiles are broken, everything. What? And um, it's like, dude, this is insane. Like you, does it look like this in the summertime? And he's like, oh no, we get it cleaned up right before the summer. And everyone around there is like, no, no, he doesn't. People <laughs> swim in this just like this. Ugh. And uh, I just couldn't believe that you could look at that and think that that's acceptable. But there's a lot of probably um, properties out there that they're just like, oh, I don't I don't swim here. You know what I mean? 100%. And I have a lot of people who follow my Instagram as well as my Facebook page where I post a lot of articles about water safety and equipment and drowning prevention. And I would say only 50% of the people who follow those pages are actually pool professionals. The other 50% are consumers, parents, people who are genuinely interested in the information so that they can be better consumers and that they can patronize pools that are safe, that are clean, that are compliant. It's just, it's something that there's no training, uh, no training wheels if you don't know about pools, what to look for. And the conversations coming out of that and the community that I'm able to build with the business and other corporations in terms of understanding, you know, there are options for you. You don't have to swim in that green pool. You can look up you can look up inspections online and find a clean pool to take your kids to swim at, right? You can find a safe personal flotation device that is approved by the U.S. Coast Guard. You don't need to pick up the one at Costco. Yes, it might cost you some more money, but it's going to keep your kids safe by putting their face above the surface if they're unconscious or they fall in. Right. Couldn't agree more. And I think something we can all do better is kind of more of that soft approach when talking to any kind of professional, especially at a hotel where it's not so aggressive where they get turned off by it, but it's like, Hey, like, I just want to share these things because I care about you care about your guests and care about people in general. And if these things aren't up to code, um, it can result in, you know, somebody 
being killed on your property. You could be put out of business, but also do you want that on your conscience that something like that happened at your property? And um, it's extremely serious. So I think what we'll do is we'll just put your phone number at the bottom. And if anybody has <laughs> any issues at a hotel, you just call Katie and she'll she'll fly right out there, get the pictures, do the whole do the whole thing. Just, I mean, I'm if you kidding. send me a first class <laughs> ticket and a couple nights accommodation, we'll see what we can work out, right? You, you know we will. So okay. But I think the last thing, Greg, to your point is is incredibly valid. I learned in municipal recreation when you're in kind of a heavy administrative environment, I learned the power of managing up right? You can't always be the game changer at your level and higher. You can be the game changer and the leader for the staff below you, but you can't necessarily move a recalcitrant institution. And so you really have to massage. It's kind of like expecting um, a second date on a, after you ask someone to marry you, right? That's, that's a big step. So let's start in little steps. And what is the most appropriate thing that you can do at this point in time? I'm not passing judgment as to how we got here. I'm just saying I'm informing you so you can't say you didn't know. And let's find a path forward together in the best interest of the customers and the facility's liability, right? So public shame is not the way to go. It's simply saying, have you considered that only using four screws on your main drain covers that has holes for eight screws is not a good choice. I understand hiring somebody with an underwater drill to anchor four new holes is expensive. I understand that's a tough sell to your GM, but when there's an incident that results in millions of dollars of liability, it's gonna come back to you for not pushing sufficiently or documenting in an email that you said we need to do this. Right, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean. It's just one of those things that it's in it's inevitable. Something will happen if you don't fix a fence, you don't fix a gate, um, you don't fix the skimmer, the main drain, all these different things. It's just a matter of time. Um, you can type in Google swimming pool news and it's like every day, every other day, um, there's a kid that has drowned. There's um, an elderly person that has drowned because, um, you know, it's not just kids. It's it's everybody, especially at hotels. You people have one too many drinks, slip and fall. Um, there's a lot of different things that that can happen. So whatever kind of precaution you can take, um, you should definitely try and do that. So we're going to jump into the next segment here. And so we discussed CPO training uh, with Wayne Ivasech um, periodically throughout different episodes. Can you share with us what it means to be a certified pool operator? Absolutely. So I am a certified pool operator, CPO instructor with the Pool and Hot Tub Alliance, formerly known as the National Swimming Pool Foundation, who is merging with the Association of Pool and Spa Professionals. What does that mean? It means you've taken a two-day class and you've met the basic requirements from that class, which includes a licensing exam, to be certified as a pool operator. The number one thing that is misunderstood about the CPO course, in my opinion, is that it makes you a good operator. It doesn't. And a lot of people choose not to take that course because they say, I'm already a good operator. I'm already a master chemist. I'm already a great service tech. I get that. But you need that basic overarching knowledge of the industry and different requirements to be able to be a good operator in terms of how you run your facilities and how you service your pools. It's no different from a 16-year-old getting a driver's license. They should go to driver's ed. They can do it on their own with their parents, but it's not going to make for a happy household, and it's a lot more efficient to go to a class. They then go and get their driver's permit. They get a driver's license. Does that make them a good driver? Absolutely not. They need to continue on the trajectory of becoming a better driver through practice, through road conditions, through different vehicles, through different life experiences. But it is the basic requirement as set by the local authority, whether that's state, federal, national, et cetera. Right. And I think something it does extremely well, because I'm sure we'll get to it, but we just, you know, went through the two day course with you and it was it was amazing because even if you knew you know, uh, I don't know, 50, 60% of the things that are in that book, it makes you insanely aware of a lot of things that you didn't understand about the pool industry in terms of, you know, regulation. There's all these different forms because I think there's a ton of things on the commercial side that, yeah, it might not um, be something you have to do in residential, but why not raise the bar for your business? If you're a business owner, why not try to be as responsible and 
you know, just run the best service department that you possibly can and try to implement some of those things from commercial to residential. And I think a lot of those daily checklists and all the different things that um, they do, um, I just think it's really good and it, it makes you just really aware. What do you think, Ty? Yeah, I think, you know, it was definitely eye opening and we talked a little bit about it before, but I think, you know, being in the class and seeing what is out there really takes you, opens your eyes to what you probably should be doing in a residential setting as well. And like you said, I think a driver's license is a good analogy. You know, you're going to driver's school to learn how to drive. You're going to a CPO class to learn how to take care of a pool but doesn't mean that you can actually take care of a pool. It doesn't mean you can actually drive, you know, once you leave driver's ed, right? You have to, you can do the functionality of it. You know, you can, you can sort of know how to drive, you know, where to put your hands, you know, kind of, you know, some of the laws, but that's really a lot of the signage, a lot of the laws, everything you're learning in CPO class really helps you, you know, out in the field. So I think that's a really good point. I think a lot of people and this probably was us a long time ago, might be nervous that they're going to have to um, break bad old habits because now you're bringing math into the equation. You're using the saturation index. You're using all these different things, and you were so used to what somebody had taught you a long time ago, and it's like, I've been doing this for years, and now I'm going to have to go because I think everyone's aware enough to know that there is a lot more math and science to, you know, measuring a pool and understanding the chemistry and, you know, flow rates and different things like that. But I think some people are just a little bit, um, you know, skeptical of the class because it's like, oh man, if I learn all this, it's like, especially what is the teacher going to think about me? Like, I don't know what I'm doing, but in all honesty, you might not know what you're doing and it is what it is. You know, you don't want to be reckless out there and just doing these things to the pools and you're not, you know, hundred percent on what you should be doing. Yeah, no, I would absolutely agree with you. There is a lot of fear that's unspoken that is sitting with the students in my classes. And I try in the first 30 minutes very much to try and assuage those fears and say, look, I'm not standing here from a place of judgment. I'm not better than you. I've been there. I've used a chemical liquid feeder pump in a light timer as a temporary solution to feed chem. Is that a best practice? Absolutely not. But we've all been there and we've learned from those mistakes. And what you're saying to me by being here today is that you want to be the best operator you can be. And that means understanding the landscape. When you get your driver's permit, you know how to drive a car. You don't know how to drive a boat. You don't know how to drive a school bus. You don't know how to drive a Mack truck. That's just one piece of the puzzle. Pools are the same way. You might run a residential pool route. You might run a commercial pool you might run a water park, you might move into building, you might move into replastering. There's many different aspects of the industry. And I feel that a benefit to students in my classes is I'm able to share my experience and my knowledge of what's out there so that they can broaden their horizons quickly and really start to file that information that they get from sources such as these podcasts, such as from shows, such as from reps. And so they're aware of, well, maybe right now I'm not doing this, I'm not doing resurfacing saying, or I'm not, you know, doing renovations, but I know someone who is, or I know where to go when I'm ready to make that jump. And information is very much power. And I think it's important that we understand that. And we know that as instructors, CPO instructors, we know there's a lot of fear. We know there's a lot of stress. We know you're taking two days off your route. We know that your boss paid the fee. And if you don't pass, it might not be a good, good thing for you. But we're here to support you and support the industry. And we do have a role to play. And so it's just a little bit frustrating sometimes when pool operators might say, I'm a good operator. I don't need a piece of paper. Respectfully, the industry can be better and everyone should have a baseline amount of knowledge. Right. Thank you very much for sharing that. Even to your point, you know, with being somewhat reserved, I think some of that's even laziness. You know, you like you said, you don't want you don't want to take account that there's math involved and there's science involved and I just want to go do my 40 pools and I know how to take care of these 40 pools I've been taking care of for 10 years, right? Like you don't really want to make yourself better or want to join in on the industry. You know, you just want, are comfortable with what you're doing. But just as we talk about in every, all other aspects of everything we discuss, you know, the world is changing, the industry is growing. And, you know, as we get better and more technology comes out and all this stuff happens, those people are going to get washed away. They, don't, they need to, you know, you need to be able to up your game a little bit and be able to, 
you know, hang with everybody else, for lack of a better word. Well, and you never know, it may actually be better. Everybody's coming to that fear with a place of saying that, I know it's going to suck, I don't want to do it. But what about if you learn something that you didn't know? Or what about if you discover something that changes your business model or connects you, the networking is invaluable. I, if you don't like the class and you have to sit for two days, that's fine. You're still going to meet at least 8, 10, 20 people in your industry. And we have a micro industry. If you live in a big urban area, how else are you going to meet other pool service professionals, builders, technicians, right? The networking is huge. And people often don't realize that on coffee breaks, on lunch breaks, you are meeting peers and that might be the first time you've ever met somebody outside of your organization who understands the pressure you're under from your for example your hotel gm to keep the pool looking you know great right yeah and it it just makes you a better salesperson as well i mean that is huge for what we do because you know we can't run a business without making money and the more you understand this industry and you understand how all the different equipment works and how plumbing works and how water chemistry works the much easier it's going to be for you to be in that backyard and have that conversation with uh, customers and your team um, when you're explaining different things you can say it with sort of that conviction like dude this is what it is this is why you don't want to do this this is why you want to have a variable speed pump installed, whatever the conversation looks like, it's just going to make you um, that much better to have those conversations. I think one of the big things people ask is like, how many, do you know how many gallons my pool is? And I would say 80% of people guess at that, right? Like, you know, you just, I've serviced pools for five, six years. I think I've seen pools like this. It's probably around 10 to 12,000 gallons. Well, that's, you know, a decent way of saying it to a customer, but if you really want to impress them, you can go measure the pool, right? And be like, your pool is 12,500 gallons. And this is how we take care of a pool that size. Plus you can, your pricing, you know, if you if you have a pricing per gallon, you know, or you understand, you know, your your little pools are priced at this, your bigger pools are priced at this. If you understand how much gallonage it is, you understand how much chemical it takes, you can price that pool correctly too. So there's a lot of you know, being able to measure it, which is the math part we're talking about, you know, is, is very valuable to run a business and it impresses customers. And also if you want to use the LSI, you need to know the gallonage, right? You need to, if you want to learn dosing calculators, you need to know the gallonage. So being able to measure that pool correctly has a lot of advantages. Yeah. Because the right customer that is going to pay on time and do all these different things is the same person that cares that the person that's in their backyard knows what they're doing. Exactly. And let's say they don't even know what they're doing on the face of it. As a pool operator, you're going to get that knowledge from the class. You're going to get the networking opportunity. But then when you're working with clients, you also get to distinguish yourself as a certified pool operator. So on your uh, business card, if it's for you as the business, you're a one polar and you want to distinguish yourself in a heavily saturated market like Florida, like Arizona, like Texas, you have paid an extra bit of money. You can charge more for that. Or if you don't want to, because it's super competitive, you can distinguish yourself on service by saying, this is what I offer by having this training. And I often see now increase Increasingly on Instagram accounts, people are putting that they're CPO certified right in their profile. Yeah. And so as a consumer, if you've got Mrs. Jones, who's, you know, only feeding her kids organic food, and she's really concerned that Susie and Joey are only swimming in very clean water, then to say, look, I'm CPO certified by an internationally recognized organization. This is what I have to offer. This is why I'm slightly more expensive than my competitors, because I understand the risk of pool water contamination and my number one priority is to keep you and your family safe i mean that sells it you don't need to say more than that a couple sentences will really your elevator pitch work on it that's how you get those accounts and that's how you run a successful business right for sure love that and you just sneak a salt cell from behind your back <laughs> i have a feeling you're really gonna like this let me tell you about this We've had long conversations this week, listeners, on salt cells and how we might feel about them. Just not a hundred at one facility. <laughs> so, All the vegans I know love this salt cell. This is the right move. Was that a Tesla I saw out there? Uh, All Tesla. You don't they know. Were. I could be vegan. That's fine. You might be. I don't know. I haven't. Seen. No. I'll eat what vegans eat, too. <laughs> and meat. <laughs> and meat. <laughs> so... If someone is just starting out in the industry, how do you think, you know, getting certified can really help them 
So I think it's really important to prioritize the CPO certification ASAP. If you can't do it the first month or two, I get that. You've got overhead, you've got costs, you're, you're spending out the whatever just to get your co- just to get started. I get that. But certainly if you're in a seasonal market where you're taking winters off, you should plan and put some money aside that you're doing it within nine or 10 months. The number one sales point for me as an instructor when I talk to potential CPO students is I think the networking and the resources. So I always continue to be a resource to my CPO students. They are welcome to text me, to call me, to email me at any point in time. I will get back to them as soon as I can. If I don't know the answer, I will send them to someone who does. That is a part of the service that I provide. Every instructor is a little bit different in how much they're willing to take in terms of time. But for me, that's that's my role is to be a mentor unofficially. And then officially, if you want an official mentor, we can set that up. I'm glad you made that clear because just so everybody <laughs> knows, that's Katie. That's not going to be every instructor out there. But you know what? I know lots of instructors and I don't know all of them, but somebody like Rudy in Florida or Tim with Aquatic Council, I mean, they're taking texts four or five years later about questions that operators genuinely cannot quickly find resources for. So one that came up recently, Tim and I text frequently, he had said he got an email about a pool operator who wasn't sure if a colostomy bag was acceptable in a swimming pool, and it absolutely is, if breastfeeding was acceptable in a swimming pool. And those are very sensitive topics, and you don't want to make the wrong decision, but you also don't know who to ask. A lot of operators are not comfortable calling their health inspector because even though they want the right information, they're fearful of, well, what is he going to think of me that I didn't know the answer, right? And then is he going to come and inspect me today because he he thinks I don't know what I'm doing, right? And so I think the the networking with other people in your area, the mentoring piece with some instructors, if not all of them, and then the ability to get a groundwork foundation in pools of all types and sizes and how they work and all of the pieces that go into the management is really key in two days. And you're spending maybe, depending on your market, $300, $400. The certification lasts five years. So really, can you afford 80 bucks a year? Probably, right? Cut out some coffees. Dude, if only, you know, anybody that's listening to this that you know, you just got started within the last year or two, and maybe you have less than a hundred customers even, dude, we could not suggest more taking this course in class because it gets so much more difficult when you've built up all these bad habits and you have insane amount of customers that you have to take care of. And you now have, you know, a large team that you got to take care of. It makes it super, super difficult to go backwards. So, you know, Anybody listening to this that's just getting started, please do yourself a favor and, you know, be a part of this and take the class. You will seriously thank us later because it's just you learn an insane amount and you might as well get started off on the right foot because there's going to be a lot. I mean, we've been doing this for, you know, five, six years. And, you know, the stuff that we learn in that class I've never even heard of before. And we're always listening in different places, but there are certain things never even heard of before and um, thought was fully off our radar. Like, I didn't know that you couldn't shave in a pool. I'm just kidding. <laughs> are, <laughs> I'm you, just kidding. are you shaving was... in your pool, Greg? I mean, everybody <laughs> but, wants to know. Hey, that, that's that's my business. I'm just kidding. It's your personal pool. Yeah. No, but I... I... <laughs> but the little plastic one, The you, you guys seen it. <laughs> I got one in my office the too. Every time I shave my legs, I go into the little kitty pool. Oh, it's 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 a cl- it's a closer shave. <laughs> yeah, but I couldn't agree with your points more, Greg. I think it it's also going to get harder later when you're managing staff or managing bigger routes to find that time off. And frankly, for anybody who's listening, thinking about getting into the pool industry, even don't shoot me guys, the residential homeowners who want to take the CPO class. I see them in my class all the time. I see the GMs in hotels. I see parents, right? Lifeguards are a huge, huge uh, group in my market. Lifeguards who are interested in taking the next step into management. You do not need to have a lot of background in pools to take the certified pool operator course. I have had people, it is their first day on the job in building maintenance at a large resort. They've never touched a pool other than to swim in it. Their first thing HR does is put them in a CPO class. Yes, it's a little bit stressful for them because it is a lot of information in two days without any context of water chemistry, but it's doable, right? I just have to hustle a little bit harder and make sure that they're comfortable with the material. They take a little bit longer on the exam. 
anybody can take this course. And I strongly encourage everyone to take this course because it's it's a huge part of the industry and it really sets the standard. Yeah. And I think another important note is to go into it with the right mindset to listen to the education and what you're teaching and absorb it and truly figure it out the best way you can. Or, you know, make sure you're highlighting everything that is being discussed because you really need to understand it, not just to, you know, take it in so that you can take the test and pass it and you can put on your website, you can tell everyone you're CPO certified, but to truly absorb it and to understand it and apply it in the field the best way you can, I think um, that's another really powerful thing is to not just do it to do it. I mean, when we listen to podcasts and books and things like that, go into it with the right mindset. Like, why am I listening to this? Why am I reading this? Why am I doing this? It's because I, I want to be better at this. You know, you get what you put in, in everything you do, you put in the work, you're going to get good results. And in that same vein, I would say plan to take it when it works with your schedule. Nothing drives me more crazy when a uh, manager, a GM somewhere, they book their pool guy in for around Labor Day or around Memorial Day or around in Canada, we have Victoria Day, right? That's already a stressful time for startup. That's already a stressful time for service. Look at the schedule that the instructors are offering. A lot of us are putting them out a year in advance. Look at your 2020 schedule. Find a time. Maybe January is your off season. Maybe February is your vacation month. Plan it. Plug it in. Pay the fee. Put it on the calendar. Commit. Just do it. Yeah, I got a really powerful tip for that, and that's put it on the calendar. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) uh, Don't don't book a bunch of other stuff on that same day at that same time. Uh, I think that would really help. (laughs) <laughs> it happens though, right? And people, they show up late because they forgot or, you know, it, it happens. But if you pay the money, you're committed. It's it's super important. And you're really, you're reinvesting in yourself. And everybody who listens to this podcast is reinvesting in themselves, reinvesting in the business, reinvesting in the industry. And if you don't like it at the end of two days, that's fine. I'm not going to be personally offended. I think mindset is a big piece of it. And I do get those guys. They're two years from retirement. Their job description has changed at a big organization. And they tell me straight up, I don't want to be here. You can't teach me anything you don't know or I don't already know. And they look me up and down and say, what could you possibly know that I don't know? And, and that's fine. That's them. That's who they are. That's where they're at in life. I don't take offense. I see those guys all the time. But even those guys, they they need that, right? I mean, that's they're, if they're going into, like, a lot of older people can't be out in the field working forever. So, you know, you have to have a certification to work in some of these facilities, and that's what you need. So go in there with that mindset. Like, you know, I, mean, I already know a lot of this stuff, but I need the certification to pass for my boss. And now I can move into some type of management role instead of being out in the field working on my hands and knees for 40 years, right? You can use that knowledge, be smart about it. You have 40 years of knowledge, right? Get the certification and then use it for something that's easier on your body. Uh And it's two days that you're missing out on. So say you're not doing bids and different things like that. If you plan it accordingly, maybe probably do it in the fall or winter, but that two days, I mean, you can't put a price on that kind of training in what you're going to get out of it. I mean, it's going to come back in just the way that you're going to be able to actually talk to your team and teach your team. Because if we had done that, you know, we would be able to take, you know, pieces of the chapter and, you know, provide training. Even if the team is CPO certified, it's like, we're going to go back into this and we're going to re-talk about every single one of these. And we're going to do training on this this morning for, 30, 45 minutes, we're going to talk about, you know, testing and understanding chemistry and adding the right, you know, dosage um, to the pool. How are we going to find the right dosage? Well, let's, let's work it out together. You know, whoever clowns on somebody like get your shit and get out of here. I think to Tyler's point, I think it's really understanding that there's a large variety within the aquatics industry. And that's one of my personal passions is exposing people to the fact that there's pools 
And there's all kinds of pools and different types of roles associated with that. And so I think when I say the term aquatics industry, I feel that that better represents not only the swimming pools, which is the builders, the service guys, the managers, the maintenance, but there are there's hockey arenas with spas and with swimming pools in them. And if you've always had a dream of working with a professional sports team, maybe you're in is getting into building maintenance and you are CPO certified and you're taking care of that hot tub or the spa that the players use. There's so many other jobs out there that require this information that can get you off your knees, that can get you out of the sun, and you're still providing a benefit to the industry. It's just not in the literal way that you've always thought of. I have to do a, a route or I have to do repairs or I have to do refinishing. There's so many pool jobs out there. And that's a huge part of the industry that I think a lot of people haven't ever considered. Right. And we won't go down this rabbit hole too much, but it's going to get so much more competitive um, in terms of marketing. Yeah, you might legally, you might not need to be CPO certified, but there's um, platforms like Yelp and Google and Bing and different things like that, that there's a way to make you um, a verified, you know, a service person on Google or Yelp and different things like that. And if you're not one of those, like you very well might find yourself on the second, third page of Google. It's not a good place to be. That's where they hide dead bodies. <laughs> yeah. In filters. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. So I think it's really important to have that and um, man, just milk it in every way you possibly can. And say that people might think like, oh, like just do it just for marketing purposes. No, like don't be foolish. Like use it because you need to be educated and know these things. And that way you can apply it in the field, but use it for your marketing on your website and make sure that it's being visible, that customers are paying a premium because you're doing things correctly and you are certified and you're coming up, you know, as a highly ranked um, professional. Well, and we also haven't talked about the legal piece in that it also demonstrates a basic level of competency, right? So as instructors, we often say we are not responsible for what you do when you leave this class. If you return to those bad habits and you put somebody in danger, the uh, Pool and Hot Tub Alliance is not going to help you right? But at the two days that you spent with us, you were taught the best practices and we've given you invaluable understanding of risk and duty of care, standard of care, liability, negligence that will never leave you. And so we could be saving you from a critical error at some point that you would have otherwise made in terms of risk towards your customers. Right. For sure. Here at Pool Chasers, we're all about sharing information so that you can become even more knowledgeable pool professionals. The folks at Pentair get that. And to show their appreciation, we invite you to enroll in the Pentair Partners Incentive Program. This flexible and simple program rewards you for your loyalty, starting with your very first sale of Pentair equipment or systems. Not only that, but being a partner gives you immediate and exclusive access to programs and training events, all which are developed to help drive even more business to your door. So to start earning rewards, visit pentairpartners.com or click the link in the write-up below. Yeah, so let's get into the book. You know, that's one of the most valuable resources. So can you touch base on some of the chapters, you know, maybe some of your favorites so the listeners can get an idea of what they may learn in the class? Absolutely. So the Certified Pool Operator course, you get a book that is included with your fee. Some instructors break it out separately, but you're required to receive a copy of the book. The book covers 18 different topics. They all will apply to the industry. They may not apply to you in the role that you currently have, but they're all topics that we feel are beneficial to the operator to understand and have an awareness. So to Greg's point about maybe you have a homeowner who has a specific concern about something that you don't actually do with your business, you can still sound knowledgeable and the power of that referral or that power of restating your expertise and your knowledge is, is going to be important important. So different topics that we cover include regulations and guidelines. Mathematic calculations is a big one. And I know that stresses a lot of people out, but we are old school in that we do feel that you should have basic competence in being able to perform these calculations yourself without the assistance of a phone app. 
So we do teach how to find gallonage, area, water volume, how to dose different chemicals that will be used in water balance, how to achieve water balance, how to calculate flow, the turnover of a swimming pool. We address chemical testing, different types of chemical testing. I think this is something that's also not well understood in the field with service technicians. There are different ways to test water. There's color metric, there's photometric, there's titrometric. If you're stuck in a rut with one supplier or one region, you may be missing out on great new technology that's actually going to help you in the field. We also talk about how to keep appropriate records for risk and liability. We discuss how hot tubs or spas are considered higher risk amenities. They take up more of your time, even though they're often smaller than the the cold water basins themselves. So we cover 18 different topics uh, in different depths, but the 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 foundation is huge for the for the class. Yeah. Right. So one of my favorite chapters to teach is actually water circulation. So a lot of people haven't necessarily considered how the water circulates through the swimming pool. So they come in and they do a service call and they see the filter, they see the pump, those are operating the way they should be. They check the water chemistry and they leave. How well do you know your pools in terms of are there dead zones that are not circulating? The way in your house, if you turn on the AC and you want the house to be colder, there may be rooms or closets or certain spaces that don't come to temperature as quickly. Every swimming pool is engineered and then constructed and they're not always done in the way that they need to be, right? You guys have experienced that where it's not built the way it should be and it doesn't work the way it should. So but you water- showed us, you know, not to cut you no, off, please, but... Yeah. You showed us how to figure some of that stuff out, even through um, using like a dye test where you can see that there's proper circulations in this 75% of this portion of the pool, but this other spot has little or no circulation. So what does that tell you that, you know, something needs to be adjusted or fixed? Also that you should test in those dead zones too, not just in the good zones. So you understand what what the chemical readings are actually in those zones too and that doesn't mean your pool is all that same you know chemical dosage yeah i'm a huge fan of dyeing the pools so just to be clear when we talk about dyeing the pool we're not using kool-aid we're not using fabric dye we're buying pool grade dye and the dye functions as a contaminant so we've neutralized the chlorine in the swimming pool we're introducing the dye at the skimmer so it's going to the filter room and returning to the basin via the return inlets we are videotaping the dyeing of the pool to verify the circulation, to identify dead zones, to verify perhaps turnover and circulation requirements. The dye is is fairly expensive. Let's say it's $200 for a bottle that can be used over multiple locations. But the wow factor, if you're doing that with a new pool or a co- let's say a client is having a, a flow issue, water is clear. You really don't know where that flow issue is honestly is until you dye it neon yellow or purple. And the value added, if you've serviced that pool for a long period of time, or you anticipate servicing that pool for a long period of time, as to Tyler's point of testing the water from a dead zone, if the dead zone is compliant, then you know the whole basin is compliant. Often we're I'm seeing operators in the commercial setting, they are testing in the filter room from the purge line on the probe chamber basket. They think that's the best practice, but honestly, they're getting the answer that they want by checking in the filter room, typically before the injection of chlorine, but they're still close to the point of injection where the controller is going to give them the answer that they want. We want to check at the point of contact with the bather and that ensures that the water is compliant where the humans are and the dye test is a great way of doing that and that could be something that you offer and you're the only guy in your area doing that right offering a dye test right i didn't realize it was that expensive why is that uh, the dye is proprietary. It's it, The formulation is very scientific. And so off the top of my head, I spent about $200. Everything is more expensive in Canada. And obviously, I paid, I paid the cost that my supplier gave to me, right? I don't rep products, so I'm paying what the consumer pays, right? So certainly, I would anticipate that service guys that have a relationship with a supplier or a warehouse, they're going to get a better price than I did as a consumer. But I feel for me, it's important not to rep products, and I pay what I pay. That was $200 for 150 grams, of which that worked on a 200,000 gallon pool. And therefore, you could use it on numerous smaller pools. Yeah. Spent 200 (laughs) bucks. Better be able to use that on numerous pools. All right. 
But definitely in watching the video on it, you could see how that that really helps because there's a lot of pools out there that we used to have. We're like, dude, like what the hell is yep. going on? Yep. Well, yeah. and you never know what's not working, right? So we saw at the Cortez pool, you had asked, well, what are those discs? And they were floor diffusers. Those are very common return uh, fixtures in a commercial setting. And it's a male and female piece with an adjustable height and then screws hold it in place. If a kid really wants to stomp on it and break it, it will implode on itself and <laughs> will seal off that return. Uh, and you won't have any means of knowing that. If every couple years on that commercial property they're doing a die test, it pays for itself in terms of the opportunity to upsell on product and repair. It also pays for itself in terms of knowing what's going on in that pool. Um, a very famous situation in Canada, we had a pool in the city of Windsor near Detroit. It was a 50 meter competition pool and they were having challenges with the hydraulics. The water was not flowing the way it needed to during swim meets and the swim coaches were getting very upset because their swimmers were not getting good times. And this whole investigation was finally resulted in a dye test. So they did a dye test of the aquatic facility and they found numerous returns still with the construction plugs on them. And this oh. pool had been open for two or three years, wow. right? And it happens, right? Guys get distracted. They don't unseal something during construction. In Europe, a lot of new uh, pools, the holdover payment is not released until the pool is dyed successfully to the standards that are expected based on the specs and engineering, right? So that's something because you don't know that it's working the way it needs to unless you verify it. And again, water is clear. How else do we verify it? All right. All right. So I got kind of a weird question. How much do you, you being around swimmers at facilities, how much do you like, like swimmers, like the athletes that are swimming um, professionally or whatever, how much do they know about swimming pools? Have you ever heard some of them just ramble off like, well, check this or check that? I would say that they don't necessarily know a lot. I actually had an employee a number of years ago. She quit on my birthday, so I always remember that. Don't quit on your boss's birthday. You oh. will remember them and then talk about them in a podcast five years <laughs> how, later. How sweet. <laughs> That's awesome. So literally in her <laughs> resignation email, uh, she said, I did not know that I would have to add chemicals to the swimming pool. And she was operating for me as a lifeguard, senior lifeguard. And in the facility in the rural community where I was at, the lifeguards did water tests and they did water balance. So they would add, let's say between shifts or between swims, we would add muriatic acid to the pool to bring it into range if the feeder had stopped working and we were repairing it. And literally in her email, she said, I didn't know we would have to add chemicals to the swimming pool. The tie in to your question, Greg, is she was a former competitive swimmer and had swum for 15 years competitively. So wow. she swam in a pool for 15 years. She lifeguarded pools, but she didn't really realize there was chemicals in them, like saltwater pools. That's great. Did wow. she say happy birthday? No. In the, in the subject? <laughs> no. Oh, how sweet. Let me see what this says. Happy birthday. Oh, like that Katie. customer had told me. Oh, you're quitting. Yeah. You're fired. Merry Christmas. Oh yeah, to you in the yeah. same email or yeah. in the same in the message. Same email. I mean, it was it Merry was uh, in December, and so she's like, "Yeah, well, we're finding another pool guy." Merry Christmas! <laughs> I got a ticket on my birthday at, uh, on the military base. I was oh, like, "Come on!" I was like, "Oh man, come on, can you come here a break, man. Today's my birthday." He's like, "Today's your birthday?" I was like, "Yeah." Huh? Goes back to the car. He's taking like five minutes or however long they take. <laughs> Comes back and he goes, "Happy birthday, dude!" Gave me a ticket. <laughs> Were you speeding? <laughs> Yeah, but the, uh, <laughs> I was like, uh, I think it was like five over or something like that. But uh, there on the base, they don't, they don't the mess MPs, around. You're yeah. like one, no, no. one over. They, pff, Man, they're just, they'll get you. I was going to say, so my husband was in the U.S. Infantry for 20 years, and he has words about MPs, military police, and, and their function. <laughs> man, they're, got one too many sodas in the car. You got two cup holders. You got three sodas. Unacceptable. Get Ticket. out of the car. You got to justify your existence, buddy. Well, what else is what else is covered on here? Uh, so water circulation is a great one. Uh, I also, in the water circulation chapter, I spend a lot of time on anti-entrapment. So entrapment is a topic that I have a personal passion for ensuring that my operators leave fully understanding. My background is I spent 16 years as a lifeguard and I'm now a lifeguard instructor trainer in Canada. And so I have that safety piece in my soul. And pool operators often think, not my jam. I don't have to worry about safety. I just do the pool. I'm the pool guy. 
And entrapment is a huge piece. So you've all heard it before. Please don't tune me out for the next minute. But the Virginia Graham Baker Pool and Spa Safety Act 2008 all drain covers in commercial settings and ideally in residential settings, I'll talk about that in a second, need to have an unblockable drain cover. And what that means is that a kid cannot lay on their stomach on a flat drain and cover it, then causing a major, major injury. Okay. My biggest pet peeve with VGB is VGB compliance has been a great success in its enforcement in commercial settings. There is no residential compliance requirement on existing facilities. New construction, yes. Major renovation, yes. California, where they do everything extra special, yes. Everywhere else in the country, in the United States, in Canada, internationally, there is no retrofit requirement, generally speaking. And that's really scary to me. Okay, so if you're taking your kids, you rent a house in the country for a weekend, it's got a nice big pool. How do you know that that drain cover is compliant? How do you know that that variable speed is not supersized for this little pool and is not going to cause a major injury? Right. I think, you know, one, one, to your point with that, one thing we didn't realize and do very well, I don't think was until the very end when we learned it was, you know, when you drain a pool, you're required to change out those main drains. It then becomes an empty basin, which becomes your responsibility. We never, you know, we always offered it as like an upsell, but I never really understood that we are supposed to change those out when you drain a pool. So going back, just put that in the cost. Yeah. Put you it charge in the cost. This, they don't know just, you know what? And we'll also throw in, you know, uh, a new anti-entrapment drain cover. And uh, it's very oh, really? easily you, explained. You do that, like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. oh, like don't, oh. Don't give them you, the option. Exactly. <laughs> well, and it's an upsell. It's an opportunity because as soon as you say safety, most people don't decline it, right? If you say, well, my concern is that if you continue to operate with this drain cover, because it also is talking to the age of the drain cover. If you take over service on a pool and you don't know the install date on that VGB compliant cover, it could be expired. The anchors could have failed. I see the screws rot a lot faster than actually the drain cover breaks. Yep. That was one of the reasons in the fall 2019 article I have in Pool Pro Magazine with Rudy Stankowitz, I discuss visually inspecting the main drain cover from the pool surface. If you have the print edition, there is a mistake and it will sound like I'm talking about the pool cover itself. In the online edition, it will be corrected to explain I intend it to mean the main drain cover visually inspecting it from the surface with goggles if you are unprepared to get in the pool and check when was it installed when is it expired when is it rated it's important that we go and try and move it once in a while what does that look like on your route maybe it's just sticking the pole in every couple visits and prodding it to see that it doesn't move I had a client about eight months ago text me to say I just broke my main drain cover but I'm really happy that it broke when I did my pool open at 6 a.m. and not when we had the hockey team here this weekend, right? Because kids will sit on it, they'll play with it, the anchors will fail, and that's on you, right? It yeah. needs to be intact, and it's important that you actually check it. Health inspectors can only check from the surface. They're not looking that closely. All eight screws need to be in. All four screws is not enough. All eight screws, if there's eight holes, need to be anchored into the ground. And yes, maybe they don't want to drain. Maybe the customer says, you know what, can you do it with water in? That's when you upsell, right? You get the underwater drill, you get the scuba gear, and that's an option. And when they're faced with that cost, then they drain. Right. <laughs> and you look like a badass. Yeah. You do. Show up to the front door oh. looking like Scuba Steve. <laughs> Scuba Steve. Oh my gosh. The power of Instagram goes both ways. I mean, dye tests will rock your customer's Instagram when they have a neon green pool. Same thing with underwater drilling. That will rock somebody's Instagram. May as well be yours. Right. right. For sure. <laughs> Thinking back, man, even the customers would tell us, you know, the, their drains would break and they still wouldn't want to replace them. Like, I don't understand... You know, thinking back to that now, it's, it's insane. I mean, well, gotta, it's, it's, we, di we didn't know, but nobody taught us. But that's what part of what we're doing now is teaching you that. But, I mean, it's like. But man, you have to explain it on. correctly because <laughs> yeah. you don't want to come off as I'm just another pool guy selling one more thing I don't need. Right. Because that's the really unfortunate taste most people have in their mouth is that everybody's trying to sell them something that they don't need because they've bought things that they were told they needed and it didn't do anything for them. 
You know what I mean? Absolutely, Greg. I know where you're coming from. So as a female, when I take my truck in for service, I am primed to be upsold, right? Because that's my experience is as a female, sometimes I think, is this a thing I need or is this something they think I'm, I'm just easy? But I think the piece for me as an instructor that I hope resonated for you guys as CPO students is I use videos and I use news articles to say this happens all the time. And I'm certainly not suggesting that you send a video link to your customer showing some of the actual entrapments that have resulted in major medical injuries. But I think just having people be aware, somebody like Abby from Abby's Hope, right? She was eviscerated through her intestines. They came out because she sat on a drain in a hot tub. That's not comfortable to talk about, but it happened. And it can continue to happen without appropriate drain covers, without appropriate vacuum port covers. So if they have a central vac installed, you can Google in news alerts how many kids' arms have been chipped out of vacuum ports because the operator is too lazy to put in a plug. To say nothing of other places where the skimmer is maybe missing a door flapper or a weir and so a kid sticks their arm in there and then the they get you know there's so many opportunities for entrapment and does your customer know what they're going to do and you educating them they may not purchase while you're still standing in front of them explaining this but that information you're not going to forget abby for at least another 10 minutes and so maybe tomorrow maybe in two weeks you go you know what I'm not prepared for even half of 1% chance that that will happen to my grandbabies. Yeah. Right. And you know, kids, I think if you were cleaning a pool and you don't have kids, you might think like, they're not going to come over here. They have no business over here, blah, blah, blah. Kids are insanely curious. (laughs) You know what I mean? They see something that they don't know or understand. There's a, a hole over there. There's an opening or there's something at the bottom of the pool toys the main drain whatever it may be they're gonna go after it or just the fact that they don't have a pool themselves like they live next door to you they don't have a pool there's a body of water next door like i want to go swimming you know yeah just 100 percent, and it's unfortunate but the bodie miller death last year that's one of the main things that people don't recognize the millers had the safest pool that they could have but they went to a barbecue at someone else's house and it and It wasn't the safest pool in terms of access to the neighbor's pool, right? right? And so you don't know, your pool might be great, but your kids don't only swim at your pool. So we're coming off of summer season. Maybe your customer's pool is compliant, but the value added that you can give to your customer is also educating about, well, what about when your kids go to a sleepover at Greg's pool or Tyler's pool, right? How can they check before they get in the water that the water looks clean, that they can see the drain cover, right? There's great pictures from nonprofit resources like Abby's Hope or the National Drowning Prevention Alliance in actually showing how you as a consumer and you provide this education as an operator or a service tech to your clients about identifying what's a good drain cover, what's not. If it's got a hole, don't use the pool, right? And that can be, that's a value added that you can offer to your clients. Most definitely. Both of our pools are safe, by the way. Yeah, you you come to my pool and you didn't know what's up. You'll definitely yeah, you'll definitely know by the time you leave. Be very educated. If it's not me, it'll be my three or six year old telling you what's up. Right. In the Certified Pool Operator course, we also spend a lot of time talking about chemical testing and chemical testing. I know the technicians on service routes, they're doing it day in, day out. But a lot of people don't realize that chemical testing in the commercial facility is often not just strips. Strips are not permitted in my jurisdiction in the province of Alberta. They're not considered precise enough. Yes, many companies have technological advances right now. There's better strips, but we're talking precision testing with a photometric kit, color metric kit, titrometric kit. Other topics that we talk about, disinfection, so being aware that bromine may not be permitted in your area in commercial facilities, being aware that cyanuric acid is not permitted, stabilized chlorine such as trichlor and dichlor not permitted in some commercial pools, especially not in indoor commercial pools, and ensuring that you understand different types of disinfectants, so UV, chlorine residual, bromine residual, ozone, corona discharge. The last big one that I spend a lot of time on is pool water contamination, right? So contaminants in the pool are the biggest function that we have as pool operators. First and foremost, it's ensuring that the system delivers the chemicals that it needs to if you have automation. And I've always been in commercial, so automation is required by law. 
automated feeders and automation system. But pool water contamination is what comes in off the body, what falls in off the leaves, what comes in off the dog, what comes in off the, the mouse that falls in the pool, and ensuring that it doesn't create an unsafe bacteriological environment. That can also include uh, fecal contaminations, accidents that happen when kids get in the pool. How do we respond and how do we ensure that the water is not a breeding ground? Yeah, but those topics come up and, you know, you need, should be able to learn how to handle them. You know, I, I think one of the biggest ones we get is like, because we're in the desert is like, like you said, rats or bunnies or other things that get in the water. I, I mean, I can't tell you. Did you just say bunnies? Bunnies. Jackrabbits. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. So cute. <laughs> not hey, like man, stuffed, we had that one not pool. Not like stuffed bunnies. <laughs> we had the one pool that had like seven dead bunnies every time. <clears throat> or I mean, let me see. Right. Seven dead rats. <laughs> Seven dead rabbits. <laughs> oh, you're killing You know what that was enough. That's what happens when you have kids. It's called bunnies. You missed the opportunity to upsell the pool cover there, Tyler. Anyways, the dead rabbits. <laughs> so <laughs> we had a pool that, you know, had dead rabbits quite often, but, you know, the customers would email us in and say, hey, you know, how does, is a pool safe to swim? You know how to handle situations like that, you know, when after you learn this type of stuff. So in the certified pool operator class, the CPO class, we do discuss how to deal with different contaminants in the water. I honestly can say that I don't have any direct experience with bunnies in the pool, but with the manual and with my understanding of the risk of contaminants from animals and from the different things that might live on their skin and how long the bunnies were in there and the state of the bunnies in terms of decomposition, mm -hmm. what precautions I would want to take. Because the thing that's always funny to me too is that a lot of pool service guys, they don't actually swim. And there's no disrespect to those guys that don't swim, but you lose that sense of urgency of what it means to have water in your nose, in your eyeballs, in your ears, in your kid's face. And so I think it's important that we bring it back to the basics, which is that we're basically, we've got a big vat of water. It's an open pit. There's stuff falling in it. And the only thing that's keeping it safe from causing a disease outbreak which may end up on the news, may result in a fatality, may result in a lawsuit, is basic sanitation and disinfection. Right. You always talk about from the swimming perspective. Yeah. No, I love that because I don't <clears throat> think you can fully understand the pool industry without being in a swimming pool and feeling it and being underwater and the smells that it puts off and hearing the equipment. Because there could be a lot of things going on within the pool, even just looking at the tile and the grout line and the deck. And all these different things that might bug you or things that, you know, for the most part, you really enjoy. Because if you understand why you enjoy it, you'll. it's much easier to put yourself in a customer's shoes. 100%. And I think you need to ask yourself if you don't enjoy getting in a pool, why is that, right? Is it that the pool is not clean? It's not enjoyable? It's dirty? You you know, if you don't, I don't have a pool in Canada. Very few people have residential pools. Our season is is very short, obviously, with harsh Canadian winters. And so if you have a pool and you don't use it, ask yourself why, right? And that's why my understanding anyway, why a lot of people outsource their pool service because they just want it to be ready. They want to be able to use it on demand when they have the time. They have busy lives. It's an asset that they own. And I think the key piece is, if they only use it once, it better be ready to go and it better be ready. It better be safe. Right. Most definitely. Since we've started with Pool Chasers, we've spoken with a lot of pool builders and designers. Something they have all mentioned is that having realistic, detailed 3D renderings to show their clients is a game changer. Something that makes the rendering come to life is including products and accessories that your clients can purchase from you. One manufacturer that makes this particularly easy is Ledge Lounger. By going to ledgeloungers.com slash CAD, you can instantly download a 3D file for any product in their catalog. Everything from their signature chase to their new patio furniture, cabanas, games, is all available to drop into your 3D designs. We've seen these renderings pop up on Instagram full of in-pool and outdoor furniture, and you can't help but stop and look. If you want to transform your 3D renderings, whether you use CAD, Pool Studio, SketchUp, or any other platform, you can get the product files you need at ledgeloungers.com slash CAD. That's ledgeloungers.com slash CAD, C-A-D. So, you know, we get 
hit up quite a bit on how to build better processes and procedures and having checklists and all these different things. How can the CPO book actually help you build some of these different things? So you're absolutely right, Greg. There's a lot of documentation, a lot of paperwork that's required to run a business as well as a commercial aquatic facility. And I would say anyone would benefit from implementing more administrative processes in any business, whether you're a residential service technician, one polar, one guy. If you can invest a little bit of time in admin processes, it is going to save you a ton of time long term with that batching. So within the CPO book in Appendix A, there are sample checklists and logs that you are welcome to photocopy, modify, type up into Word, make a PDF, make an Excel sheet, Google Doc, whatever that looks like on your phone, and that you can actually standardize what you're looking for at different properties or different sites, depending on how frequently you go. So if you're doing daily service, your daily checklist is going to be pretty detailed, and but then you can have less on your weekly checklist or your monthly checklist or your quarterly checklist. And all of these documents then are done and standardized, and you can use them with different types of clients. And that includes things such as maintenance or um, backwash procedures or different things like that. So directly within Appendix A, we have opening and closing sample checklists. We have sample chemical log checklists, maintenance checklists, incident reporting, so if something were to happen, seasonal checklists. Keep in mind these will need to be modified if you're working with a commercial client. They will need to be modified for your exact jurisdiction and what the health code says. Different places require different data. So where I am, for example, in Canada, we don't have a lot of cyanuric acid that's used because it's only permitted in outdoor pools. Therefore, cyanuric must only be measured once per week. However, somewhere like Arizona, your your life depends on cyanurate, right? That's going to be measured once per day. So the checklist will be different in different locations. Right. I think that's all really good stuff. I mean, down to our bathroom cleaning schedule, we had, you know, sort of a process and a checklist that was in there um, on whose week it was and what was to be done. Um, But all those things are just kind of helpful reminders, especially in a warehouse and out in the field. Um, If you have something serviced, you should have it tagged. Mm -hmm. If you're bringing cleaners back to the shop or anything like that, make sure that you have a good process and a checklist for what's being done with it. Okay, I need to tag it, a customer's name on it and the date. It was pooled because I know that if I get here and it's like, well, who the hell is this? Man, that thing could have been out for months. That's like the worst process ever. When you have 400 pools, just trying to figure out who's cleaner that is. That is. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Checklists help everybody to stay on track. And I think the hard part as you're growing your business from perhaps a one polar or a guy who helps you out in the high season and you're going to a team, as you know, Those processes need to exist because you can't have a handle on everything and your business growth is going to be hampered by you trying to micromanage everything. So the sooner you admit that you need those processes for standardization, the better your business is going to be because you're not going to drop the ball and give Mrs. Jones's cleaner to Mrs. Smith and then she calls you or posts a Yelp review that her her cleaner got stolen. You stole her cleaner. Yeah, 100 (laughs) percent. Right. You have a good story with that, right? Yeah. Have the cops called on you (laughs) on a Sunday. But to the, to the point of the question, I think, you know, they're good references. And, you know, when we are creating some of our documents, I always wanted to like look at other people's documents if possible, or, you know, use references like that to build your own. So it really helps looking at, at something else and like making it your own. Will you have to change some of it? Probably, but at least you have like a kind of an example of like how to build it. But you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right. It's like when your business finds that sweet spot in how that process flowed, where it's like, man, that went so smoothly because we did A, B, and C. So write all those down. It's free to create a Gmail account on Google and then get into Google Docs and just make PNPs for whatever that thing is, print it out and make that sort of become a standard. Get, uh, you know, uh, Trapper Keeper or whatever the heck you call them and, you know, make sure that you're, uh, you know, you have all those available for, you know, everybody that's working there. We did things a little bit different, but I do think that that's a a really good start in doing all that. Let's start with something simple. Like you said, like a bathroom schedule or something, you start with these smaller things and kind of build, learn how to build a process first. If you didn't learn that in school or whatever, you know, learn how to build one and what works for you and your company, start with the smaller, easier stuff, and then work into things like service agreements and these bigger 
projects. Because it does a lot of things. It's creating accountability for people. And it's also, it's helping you because a lot of people are, you know, there's so much going on in a day that it really helps them kind of prioritize their day. And a lot of people just want to be told what to do. It's like, man, I got all these things to do. It's like, don't worry about it. This is (laughs) your job description. This is what is required of you today. You do one through 10 and easy as that, you know, take that thinking out of it. You need to be thinking on what you're doing, you know, on that job or whatever it is that you might be doing at the shop. I think to that point too, it's important to find a mentor, right? And this podcast is creating a culture and a community where people are saying, I want help. I need assistance. Who can help me? But let's say you're in a market where there is other pool people. It's respectfully finding somebody who's where you're at or where you want to be and saying, hey, you know, do you have time once a year to have a coffee or can I come on a route with you or can I shadow you for a day? And it's not meant to be um, that you're going to steal their business. It's not a competition. It's just saying, hey, can I come hang out with you for a day and learn how you do things? And often those relationships will give you the opportunity to see how they've done these types of documents. And if it's a respectful relationship and you don't take advantage of their time and their clients and their resources, they might share these types of documents with you and say, you know what, when I started out, this is the form I used. Where I'm at today, we've had the women up front who do the phone calls, they've made changes, here's where we're at. If you want, I can give you a copy or we can have her kind of format yours a little bit differently. I would be remiss if I didn't say that this industry has built me up through the power of many mentors at many stages. And I think that piece is missing for a lot of one polars and a lot of service technicians. And it's probably not going to be within your business, right? Because it's a lot to ask your employer to pay you and mentor you. That part of the relationship is often missing in 2019. But there are mentors out there. There are people who are accessible, whether it's remotely by text, whether it's in person through a coffee, and they want to help you. There will be those that do not, right? There will be people who will say, you know what, we are competition. I don't want to share that information with you. And that's fine. You move on to somebody who is a mentor. There are those of us that want to share our knowledge. We do not want you to make our mistakes. We don't get any enjoyment from watching you beat your head against a wall when I made that mistake 10 years ago. Let's help each other. It's not a competition. I mean, it is. We all want to end up with healthy pools. That's how I look at it. Sure, I want to make money. Sure, I want to go on vacation. But you know what? Ultimately, it all leads to the same path. Mentoring is a great point, a great piece of that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think you have to be resourceful as well. It doesn't nece- Your mentor doesn't necessarily have to be somebody in the pool industry. Um, think about your parents. Think about your parents' friends. Maybe one of them uh, is a business owner and they do really well at HR. One is good at marketing and somebody's good at um you know, something else, you know, be resourceful with that. And you should have a list of things that you need to get better at or things that you want to know where it's like, man, I need to know accounting. I need to know finance. I need to know, you know, how to hire better. I need to know how to market my business better. If you have an idea and those are things that are always in our head. I mean, I couldn't, it's impossible to do anything without talking to somebody about something. If I go get my hair cut. It's like, how's business going? Oh yeah. Like, is this a busy time of year? Oh, this isn't why da, 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 da. Even you go Chick-fil-A, you know, how, how was training when you, you know, got started here? Cause I love the service. Da, 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 da. It's like, it's, if you're always, if you have a list of what you want to know, then it's sh- get in the habit of, you know, making that sort of a a natural thing that you're just constantly thinking about. Um, But you should think outside of the box because I think people have more resources than, um, than they realize. 100%. And and if there's not somebody in your area, maybe it's through social media. I get a lot of DMs that way. I get a lot of Facebook messages. And it's typically somebody that says, you know, I've been following you for a while. I just don't know what to do with this situation. I don't know who else to ask. You know, I just I just want to do the right thing. Right. And I, I don't have a problem with that. That's kind of my role. That's why mentoring and consulting is on my business website. 
Am I going to get a paycheck from that Instagram DM? Absolutely not. That's not how I run my business. But I just want that information to be out there. And I think a lot of people, if you look at the platform you're using, maybe you like Twitter, maybe you're on YouTube, maybe you have like a local group that you belong to, like business owners, meetup, whatever, to Greg's point, you can get something from everyone. It may not be what you wanted, but it's probably what you needed. Yeah. Well, and then to your point, the DM though, maybe although you're not getting money right away, it's going to lead probably to some type of business in the future because that person is now going to vouch for you and say, oh, she helped me out when I needed help. Oh, you want to be certified? Go take her class. She's awesome. She helped me out. You know, there's all, it comes back to you, you know, in the end, if you are willing to share some of that stuff. And like we always say, we can, I can give you all the secrets, you know, to everything, but if you don't know how to execute them, it doesn't matter anyways. You have to go take that and then execute. So people that actually execute are very little. So It's a long-term game and every business owner is different. You guys have heard this. You want it good. You want it fast. You want it cheap. For me, it's good. And that might be five, six, seven years until a payout. And I'm okay with that. It's the same thing with a customer. They have a pool. It doesn't need to be rebuilt every year. It needs to be rebuilt every 15 years. But that doesn't mean that they can't send referrals, that they can't speak well of your work. They won't tell 10 other people that are that you're great. It's all interconnected. And the pool industry is very small that way, right? So my profile in my community in the province of Alberta doesn't mean that I'm not known in other provinces or other states or other countries. Everybody talks to everybody. There's a very finite number of suppliers service providers, people who make an impact. And so you never know what's going to build your credibility, your no like and trust factor. And for me, I'm just a very giving person to the point where, you know, sometimes I'm too giving, but that's where I see my role as a water safety advocate, drowning prevention advocate. And for me, currently, my vehicle is primarily in pool operator courses, right? Because that's hitting thousands of customers in thousands of facilities. Sure. That's awesome. That's a really good way to look at it is that the people you teach, they're doing their job properly. It's just spreading throughout um, every pool they touch, any interaction they come in with with other people, different things like that. Um, and it just spreads like a wildfire. I did a lifeguard instructor course recently. There was only seven in the class. So there's eight of us in the room. And I asked them, can you guys think about how many lifeguard courses you've taught in the last two years in your career? We discovered that we had taught a combined 2,000 lifeguards. So those 2,000 lifeguards are spread at pools across Canada, lifeguarding thousands of customers, but also interacting with thousands of other lifeguards. So you can be a change in the industry. You can't say you don't matter. You are impacting thousands. Right. Um, And I know we've talked about this quite a bit, but... What is your thoughts on how you can use being CPO certified to be promoted through marketing? So the CPO certification stays with the individual. It doesn't stay with the business. So if you go out on your own and your employer paid for the CPO certificate, that doesn't matter. It stays with the person. And so you use that to distinguish yourself or your business if everybody is CPO certified or your staff are primarily CPO certified. It's important to know the CPO is not assigned to the company. It it has to be very transparent in the way it's assigned to the, the, the technicians. But that said, you can use the logo, you can use the designation, you can distinguish yourself in a wide sea of competitors by having it. You also can be recognized in your area. Some health boards I know in different states and provinces will only list companies with CPO certified technicians or staff. Certainly in the province of Alberta where I work, if you are going to service a commercial client, you need to tell the health authority who's servicing it, provide their certificate of accreditation, then you can take on that pool. Right. Right. Thank you very much. But it's, you know, we talk about all the time, you know, having that certification gives you the opportunity to tell the customer that you have that and you can up your game in the backyard, but it can also upgrade, you know, your website, your, your social media, everything can then include that. And that's just validating you as an operator or as a company for a customer seeing, okay, well, you know, you may not think that you need that, but if a customer is aware of what CPO means, they're going to want somebody that's CPO certified. If they don't know what it means, it gives you the opportunity to then tell them, 
I took the time to get myself educated, to make myself better. We, as a company, we do that to make ourselves better so we can keep your pool safe for you to swim in. There's different ways to approach that, obviously, but getting business through that becomes easier because you have that you know, certification and that stamp on everything you do. Yeah. I mean, you should make the best of every situation. If you're going to be CPO certified, have fun with the photos and different videos and things like that. There should be a really good mix of photos on your website where it's really cool looking pools and it's smiling employees. It's you working at the desk. It's you at all these different training classes. It's snippet videos of understanding sizing a pool and chemistry and all these different things. It's going to help you write blog posts on how to do this. And you're just building more credibility of what you and your team actually knows. So the Things that you can do with it in terms of marketing are endless, and um, you should really think about it from that sort of point of view when you're going to training is, dude, get the photos, do all the different things with it, because in terms of websites, social, um, even Google Photos, you know, those are probably the most, you know, looked at photos online where they can very well, I mean, we at one point we've gotten, you know, 3000 views in a day on certain photos for brothers right. and they want to see that they want to see, wow, these guys look professional. They're wearing shirts. They're wearing boots, whatever. They got proper equipment. They got nice vehicles. Oh, they're in class learning about pumps. They're whatever this is. They're doing chemistry. They're doing this. They're with an instructor. They're doing this. So give it a real good mix and have as much fun with it as possible. Don't look at other people's stuff. Don't be like everyone else. Think outside of the box a little bit. Think about, I always like to say this, is that if there's a website you enjoyed, like sort of the experience of being on or even social, say you like Nike or you like um, Hurley or you like one of these other big companies, what is it about that that you like? Oh, I liked it. You know, people on there always have a fresh haircut and they look nice and they're always by the beach or they're doing this and that. It's like, take in some of that and put it towards what you're doing and, um, yeah, just make it as fun as possible. I think you can do a lot through this training. Well, and it's a, it's a marketing opportunity, like you said, Greg, and it's a whole process. It's not just showing up to the course and get us getting the certificate, engage with us on social media, right? A lot of instructors have social media profiles. You might meet people locally through discussions. I often get calls in unrelated inquiries. People are not needing a CPO course for themselves, but they're looking for CPO certified people in my area. Who can you recommend that services in my area that's CPO certified? So if the student tells me at the end of class, yes, you can disclose my name or my company, I will. For privacy reasons, I'm not just going to give out a list of my students, but I can certainly say, you know, this individual participated in my class. They were extremely diligent in their concern about these things. So I would start with these companies if I'm a consumer in your area. Sure. You get what you put in. So can you please share with the listeners where they can find more information about the CPO program and how they can reach out to you if they have any questions? Absolutely. So the Certified Pool Operator course is offered by the Pool and Hot Tub Alliance, PHTA. If that's a new name for you, it's because it's the National Swimming Pool Foundation merging with the Association of Pool and Spa Professionals, APSP. We are looking at probably one or two more years of confused co-branding. So go to the website that you are accustomed to using. NSPF.org is available. PHTA.org is available. APSP.org is available as they streamline the information. You can search on the NSPF.org website for CPO classes in your area. You can search by country. You can search by state. Not all instructors post all of their classes on that website. So if there is not a class that works for you, definitely do contact an instructor who services your area or call the foundation, the Pool and Hot Tub Alliance, excuse me, and ask for instructors in your area. We will often get uh, referrals for somebody who's looking for either private training or bespoke training in a remote location. And many of us do travel to teach both public and private classes. And where you know, in Canada, you teach in Canada, right? So where can they find you if they want to take a course from you or in your website and all that? 
Yes. So I teach primarily Canada and internationally. So for me, my business is called Lakeview Aquatic Consultants Limited. I'm based near Calgary, Alberta. However, I do teach across Canada. My courses are listed on Lakeview Aquatic Consultants, plural, dot com. They are also listed on the NSPF.org website. Awesome. Thank you. Well, we appreciate you coming and joining us on the podcast today. It's been so much fun. I love following your adventures online, on Instagram. I think that's definitely the platform to go to in 2019. And it's been a great community that you guys have built through the group, through the page, through the podcast. So I would encourage anybody who has questions for me just to reach out or we're all available, right? We're not special. We're, we're, we're not looking for special treatment. I'm not in this industry to be powerful or important. I just want to share my information and I photograph a lot of pools. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. And I think if we all learn to pay it forward, even just a little bit, I think you're going above and beyond and also what we're doing through the podcast. But if uh, you take anything from this, do the same, whatever you learn, pay it forward. When somebody's trying to come up through the industry, if there's something you can do to help, why not? Because the more professional we look, the more we're going to kind of outcast the ones that aren't doing things the right way. And that's what we want is to be held to the same standards as some other industries. So thank you very much for everything. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for checking out this episode. If you want to find out more about our guests or the sponsors of the show, you can check them out on the links we have provided in the write-up below. We have also provided links to our social media platform. So please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Our tag is Pool Chasers. If the podcast has brought you any value, please do what you can to support us through our Patreon page by going to patreon.com forward slash pool chasers. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to be updated each time a new episode is released. One last thing. If you're not yet in our Facebook group, join it today to be surrounded by like-minded individuals who are all trying to better the industry. Thank you all for the support. We appreciate your time and your ear. See you out there, pool chasers.